Good morning, and welcome to worship. The announcements for today are found on page 12 and 13. Uh, something that isn't in the announcement but is in your bulletin are inserts that look like this. Today is the last day to complete and return these flower forms uh, for the Easter lilies and hydrangeas. Easter is just round the corner. Orders have to be placed. Um, all sorts of work behind the scenes has to be done. And so today is the deadline for submitting these. You can stick them in the offering baskets. You can stick them in the green box on top of the visitor's desk that is the proper receptacle for these. Um, you can scrunch them up in a ball and throw them towards me during the sermon. However you want to get them to me, get them to me. Uh, and if, if not to me, to Michael. If not to Michael, then the office. But the green box in the narthex is the perfect place. Just slip them into the slot on the top. But please, please, please do it today and print clearly and legibly. I'm looking at my wife because she'll laugh because I couldn't write legibly if you put a gun to my head. But it would certainly help the office prevent them from having to call you to say, what was that name? So please, do that today. Um, do that as soon as possible. Be aware that this afternoon we have a concert in the garden. Weather permitting, always be aware that if the weather gets bad outside, the concert still goes on. We simply move inside. So come rain, hail, or shine, or even snow. Should it turn to snow th this afternoon, we will still have the concert, but we hope it'll be in the garden, and either way, a good time will be had by all, and the refreshments will be wonderful. The rest of the announcements you can see, Michael's class, the yoga in the garden, we're getting towards the end of March, <clears throat> so be aware, remember, that this is Refugee Month at Sakok where our refugee ministry asks for your help and support as they work with legal refugees uh, sent to us through Lutheran Services of Florida and through the federal government. Be aware that Palm Sunday is next week. That begins Holy Week. Easter is the end of that next week. And so please make, go online and make a reservation for worship on Palm Sunday, Holy Week, and Easter on the on page 13, you see a lovely little uh, notice that outlines all of the worship services here at Sakok over Holy Week and Easter. Uh, take that home with you, cut that page out, stick it on your fridge, whatever you need to do to be fully aware of all the opportunities to worship here at St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church on this most holy time of the year. Photo directories are available. They're in the hallway by the office. Also in the hallway by the office is the food barrel. Uh, things were getting a little crowded in the narthex, so some things had to move. They're there. If you ever look for something and you can't see it, ask me, ask Michael. We'd be happy to direct you towards what it is, whatever it is that you're looking for. The rest of the announcements, please, please, please give them your consideration. Um, there'll be plenty of opportunity during the sermon for you to look through the announcements, read them inwardly, digest them. But here's a final tip. Take the worship bulletin home with you, and that way you have all of the notices in your home to refer to whenever you need. Last, but by no means least, next Sunday we are visited by Pastor Mendido. He is with Lutheran Bible Translators. You know him. He's been coming here to visit us for several years, with the exception of last year when his visit had to be canceled because of, you've guessed it, COVID, like everything else. Um, he'll come and bring greetings from Lutheran Bible translators. Um, there'll be an uh, adult forum in the fellowship hall. You can join online in the usual ways. The adverts are out in connections and multiple other venues. Uh, so between the services next week, you'll be able to hang out with Dr. Mendido and hear more about the work and ministry, vital work and ministry of Lutheran Bible translators. We are a busy congregation. Please give all these opportunities your careful and your prayerful attention. But above all, be aware that Holy Week and Easter is almost here. Blink and you will miss it. Don't miss it. Now let's compose our hearts and our minds for worship.
you stand? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning Your Spirit moved over the waters, and by Your Word You created the world, calling forth life in which You took delight. Through the waters of the flood You delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea You led Your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river Your Son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and Your Word You claim us as sons and daughters, making us heirs of Your promise and servants of all. We praise You for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise You for the gift of the new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with Your Spirit and renew our lives with Your forgiveness, grace, and love. To You be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, with steadfast love you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is taken from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. 
It will not be like the covenant that I have made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive them their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. The second reading is taken from the fifth chapter of Hebrews. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. 
The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. So the readings that we use on a Sunday come from something called the Revised Common Lectionary. It is what it sounds like. It's revised. It, there was a previous version. This is the revision. It's common, meaning that all sorts of denominations adopt it, you know, freely, not by compulsion. Um, and it's a lectionary. It is a series of assigned readings on a three-year cycle, a Matthew year, a Mark year, and a Luke year, and John gets sprinkled in throughout. So when we hear readings come up, they, after a while, become familiar. Um, some come up every year, some every three years. But those of us who've been in this business for a while, you and me, we start to hear familiar phrases and words and stories. This familiar one about the Greeks coming to Jesus. The, the familiar message of unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. Uh, Pastor Wogan and I know that one right well because we've conducted so many funeral services over the year, years, and, and that's such a, a common funeral text. And, and then finishing up with that powerful image that I referred to a week or two ago, where Jesus says, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people unto myself. But it kind of begs the question, you know, I, I, I sort of alluded to this last week when I used the phrase that familiarity breeds contempt. It kind of raises a few questions, does it not, this text? Familiar though it sounds, reassuring though it sounds, hope-filled though it sounds, you know, where did the Greeks come from and where did they go? I mean, no sooner have they appeared in the text than they just go poof and disappear. And why is it, after they've gone through all the bureaucratic hoops, reporting to so-and-so who reports to so-and-so who reports to Jesus, why is it that Jesus' response is to slip immediately and seamlessly into a, into a sermon? And, and why do we have to hate our lives? And sometimes in preaching, it's, it's tempting to just ignore those big questions and focus on some of those meatier parts of the text. Most often, and I know because I've done it, to simply concentrate on the, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people unto myself. See, you're on familiar ground there. We like it. The words are poetic. They're beautiful, and they have impact. But let's tarry for a while on those questions. Who are these Greeks? We don't know, but they're probably not Greek Jews. The, the word that John uses pretty much describes Greek Greeks, you know, not convert Greeks, but Gentile Greeks, regular Greeks, pagan Greeks, meaning non-Jewish Greeks. That, that's kind of important, as we'll see in a minute. It must be somewhat of a formal visit because, and you know this, you've read Scripture, often people saunter up to Jesus and, and just introduce themselves. This almost seems like a deputation arriving and reporting sort of up the chain of command until they get to see Jesus. 
but Jesus doesn't seem to speak to them. And the reason for that is that something important has just happened. The hour is at hand. That, that New Testament word and phrase, the hour, or the hour has arrived, the hour is near, the hour is at hand, this is the hour. It's littered through the New Testament and particularly John's Gospel, meaning Jesus' moment. And don't get me wrong, Jesus' earthly ministry is full of moments, none of which are unimportant. But the hour has an importance above all others. It's the cup has been given to him. His fate has arrived. The Father's will is being enacted. The passion, his betrayal, his arrest, his torture, his execution, his burial is all coming. It's at hand. It's nearer now than it has been before. Why does Jesus assume that? Just because some Greeks are at the door. Because this is another epiphany. We're kind of familiar with the first one. It's cute. It's on every Christmas card. We love it. It's part of our childhood. I remember playing it when I was a kid in Sunday school. A non-speaking part, of course, because I'm shy. The Magi, the wise men, arrive where Jesus is living. Whether he's a toddler at this time or still a baby in a manger, the incarnation has happened. The Word has become flesh. The infinite has entered the finite. God is on this earth, robed in flesh. That's the Godhead we see. And it's Iranians that arrive. They're, they're, they're Persian wise men, modern-day Iran. They're the ones that come from afar following the star, and they are the first to pay homage around that motley crew of shepherds whom nobody likes and trusts because they're such itinerant workers. They get to pay homage to Jesus first. The wise men representing pagan Persia kneel and worship the Christ child too. The epiphany, the revelation, the realization, the recognition of who Jesus is in the manger of Bethlehem. Okay, that's the big epiphany. It's so big, we name the day after it. But in John's gospel, Jesus points to a second epiphany. The moment when he is lifted up from the earth which, as we discussed last week, could certainly refer to his ascension, but is more obviously, and especially so since John tells us, he said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. When he is lifted up from the earth upon the cross, he will draw all people. See, there's an emphasis there, all people to himself. And that's what the Greeks represent in the gospel text today. They are the all people. Not all Jews, not all believers, not all disciples, not all who follow me. There are phrases for that littered throughout the, Old, the New Testament and littered throughout John's gospel. No, Jesus doesn't say that. He says all people. And these pagan Greeks are the first of these all people. And when they appear, and when Jesus hears that they've arrived, Jesus knows that his hour has come. And he talks about death. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains but a single grain. And we're not made to be alone. It doesn't come naturally to us. We are social people. 
And more than that, we are people created to be in community with each other. That's what Genesis tells us. That's what the Ten Commandments give structure to. On, on the one table of the Ten Commandments, our relationship with God, and on the second table, our relationship with each other, all made possible by the rules and boundaries and structure, not of how we live our life in splendid isolation, but precisely how we live our life in community with each other, with our neighbor and with our God. That's the point of the Ten Commandments, not simply a checklist of thou shalt not, but a structure, a shape, a gestalt of how we're going to live our life in community. The grain is not created to be alone. It is created to die and to fall into the earth and then to bear much fruit. Jesus will show what that's like. It's a passage from death to life. We're not created to live and die and end of story, roll credits, fini. No, we are created for life. And part of that involves dying to live again. That's what Jesus means when he says, those who love their life will lose it. Well, that sounds weird, because I don't know about you, but I like life. I love my family. I love you guys. I try and show it. I hope that's not news to you. I hope you're not surprised. I certainly hope you're not shocked. But that's not what Jesus means. And, and there's an important word that gets lost in all that mix. It's not those who hate their life, period. Those who love their life in this world, that's the important bit. That's the, that's the word on which meaning lands, this world. You remember a few weeks ago, I told you that the, the text from John's gospel was unique at that point because John was saying something good about the world. And John, except for that one instance, never says anything good about the world. You know, the good was, and God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whomsoever believeth in Him may not perish, but have eternal life. The only instance in John's gospel when the world stands in any kind of positive sense, the world in John's gospel is always that thing that stands in opposition to God. It's the darkness, not the light. It's the inauthenticity instead of the authentic life. It's, it's corruption and fallenness. It's, it's waywardness. It's, it's that fooler that drags you into thinking, no, no, just look out for yourself. No, no, other people don't matter. No, you're the only one. Yeah, money and power and influence, that's all that matters. Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a secret sauce here somewhere. You, you just stumble across the recipe for life and you'll be good. And you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you don't need anyone. The world calls us to live an inauthentic life, to not be ourselves, to not be the people that God created us to be, called us to be, redeemed us to be, established a relationship with us even when we were yet sinners to be. And amidst that authenticity, amidst that inauthenticity, Amid that brokenness, we're called upon to look at our life and realize that it, it isn't like that. That's not for us. And that's the part of our life that we have to, and the Greek is, is even stronger than the English translation we have today. That's what needs to be destroyed in ourselves. That's what needs to be swept away. That's what needs to end. Not so we can die and live in some magical heaven, but so we could die to that inauthenticity 
and then begin to live. Remember what I said the other week. John believes in life before death. True life, authentic life, life filled with love and grace, mercy and kindness and forgiveness, community, sharing, servanthood, sacrifice, grace. That's the life that comes when the old self dies. Because that Greek word that gets translated into English as life isn't really literally this living, breathing thing. The word in Greek is psyche. It's that core self. It's who we truly are. Who we were truly created to be. If you'll forgive me for using this word one more time that I've kind of flogged to death in the last few minutes, to be the authentic self, the real us. Not the us the world sees, but the us that God sees. Not, that the, not the us that the world treats as a commodity, but the us that God sees and finds lovable. And then when he is lifted up from the earth, Jesus will draw all people to himself, reborn people, renewed people, restored people, lovable people, not because of who we are, but because who God has made us not because of intrinsic loveliness, but because God died for us. I say again, not the us the world sees, but the us that God sees. And in this life and death and trial and joy and sorrow in this incredible dance of life, the Lord of the dance draws us into an everlasting and glorious and astoundingly lovely community. Amen.
Please stand as together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. You wash us through and through, and remember our sin no more. Make your church a community of forgiveness throughout the world. Give your people courage to forgive. Through them show the world new possibilities. Bless ministries of repentance and reconciliation. Hear us, O God. You fill the earth from tiny grains of wheat to the mighty thunder with your presence, and you call to us and you call us to attend to your will for all creation. Grant weather that prepares the soils for seeds. Protect all from violent storms, flooding, and wildfires. Hear us, O oh God. You promise to write your law on our hearts. Guide citizens throughout the world to shape communities that reflect your mercy, justice, and peace, and give them creativity to work for the welfare of all. Hear us, O oh God. You sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Restore the joy of all who need to know your presence, those who are lonely or feel unforgivable, those who need healing of mind or body, those who are dying and all who grieve, especially Bill Belgin, Charlene Favor, Pat Harris, Cal and Joanne Hawks, Sandra Jorgensen, Judy Leninger, Denny Lau, Wilma Lynch, Rebecca Matilla, Benjamin Most, Daniel Most, Sam Myers, Jerry Nelson, Zahir Noda, Barbara Russell, Pastor Ray Siraka, Helen Shepard, Mary Ellen Shoup, Todd Simonson, Diane Snyder, Mark Stevens, Maxine Vaccarello, and Elroy York. Hear us, O God. Jesus calls us to follow him in life and death. Empower this congregation in discipleship. Equip children and teachers in Sunday school, confirmation, and learning ministries. Give us your truth and wisdom and teach us to follow Jesus. Hear us, O God. In the cross of Christ, your name is glorified. We praise you for those who have given us words to worship you, especially Thomas Cranmer. With all those who have died in Christ, especially Sharon Broncape, Bruce Beaver, Nancy Hargrave, and Dorothy Marsh. Bring us li into life everlasting. Hear us, O God. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Acknowledging with deep gratitude the generosity of congregation, both in person and online, we pray, faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places and you meet us in our hunger with the bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
all baptized Christians, regardless of the denominational background or tradition, are invited and welcomed at the Lord's table this day. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink you all of this, for this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, Lord and Heavenly Father, we now obey your Son's command. We recall his blessed passion and precious death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and we look for his coming again with power and great glory. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus draws the whole world to himself. Come to this meal and be fed.
Please stand. Let us pray. God of steadfast love, at this table you gathered your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your Spirit that our lives may be were witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. You are what God made you to be created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, free to serve your neighbor. God bless you, that you may be a blessing. In the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen.
Go in peace. Share the good news.